Hi and welcome to the fifth and final lecture of the course Introduction to Game Programming 1 DV437 Summer Course at Linnaeus University and my name is Dr. Johan Hagelbeck and today we're gonna talk about animations. So, so first some fundamental concepts regarding animation. Uh, we typically use a bone-based animation that's our focus for this course and it's probably one of the most widely used systems today, but we are our animation system as well. And in a bone-based system, we have bones arranged in a tree hierarchy. And each bone hangs from a single parent bone, and each bone may have multiple child bones. And the first bone up in the hierarchy is called the root bone. And two bones are connected with a joint, and the joint can move with or without restrictions. So this is an example of a skeleton for a horse running around a horse model. And each bone has an associated transform that determines, determines the bone's translation, the position and the orientation from its relative to its parent bone. So how the relative distance from a parent bone and the relative orientation from a parent bone. And if a transform is the identity transform, the bone is exactly the same translation and orientation as its parent. And the identity transform is uh, a matrix with ones on the main diagonal and zeros in all other entries. And if a bone has no parent, meaning that it's a root bone, the transform determines translation and orientation relative to some other defined space, typically the local object space of the game object. And in most cases, skeletons only have one root bone and it makes it, the calculations a bit easier for us. So the relative position, if we have zero, zero, that's the center of a game object, minus one and minus two for a bone means that it's uh, minus 1 in x and minus 2 in y and 4, 0, meaning that they are relative 4 in x and 0 in 1. So all the positions are relative to the previous bone, the parent bone of each child bone. And the root bone are relative to the local object space of the game object. And an animation change the transform of one or more bones over time, thus creating a motion. And the animation transforms are relative to the parent bone. So to, for example, change the position of a hand, if we have a hand, both the shoulder and the elbow are involved. So two joints and two bones are involved if we move the hand. And we have two types, uh, the animation where the mo movement is forwarded down the hierarchy of bone, bones is called forward kinematics. And in inverse kinematics we can determine the position of a last bone depending on the translation and orientation of the previous bones. And this is the most common animation in games, forward kinematics. So we simply move one joint, for example, the shoulder, and we can calculate where the other child bones have their final position. So we just move one joint and we can calculate what happens with the other bones connected to the joint we move. The forward kinematics. Its spelling error should be forward kinematics. And the opposite is called inverse kinematics. And inverse kinematics, we know the end position of a bone. For example, the hand and the bones higher up in the hierarchy is moved to keep the end position fixed. And it's used to calculate how we need to move bones to reach a specific position in world space. For example, when a character picks something up. So we know what we want to pick up, a coffee cup, and we know where a coffee cup is, and we calculate how we need to rotate the involved bones and joints to reach the coffee cup. So we know the end position, we calculate the positions backwards, and in forward kinematics we rotate one joint and we calculate what will happen forward in 
their joints and bones. A reorganization of bones and how we are collected to each other in joints is usually called a rig or a skeleton. The rig is just an organization and not an animation on its own, it's static, but it heavily influences when motions are possible. Compared to your own body, there are limitations of our joints. The shoulder joints can move in many directions, but the elbow joints can only move in one up and down. And it's possible to have multiple rigs for a character, for example one that is specialized for walking and another rig that is specialized for jumping and third one for running perhaps. And the bones transform is a matrix with three components. Translation, the position of a bone relative to its parent bone, so that's the position in X, Y and Z. Rotation, the rotation of a bone relative to its parent bone in X, Y, and Z axis, and scale, the scale of the bone in all three axes, X, Y, and Z, if we need to scale the bone. And in some cases, you can see in some literature, we have a fourth component called shear component, and it can be used to tilt and mesh. This is an example of shear, uh, the figure. But this is very rare and we will leave that component out in most calculation. Unity does not directly support shear, uh, but you can do it with scripts as I did here. We, here we have a cube and I tilted the, the cube using a shear component. And in most character animations the bones cannot scale as well, so we can often leave the scale component out. So we only have the translation and rotation. And there's also a lot of joints, for example, the elbow joints, where the bones are firmly attached. They cannot move. It's always the same position. So then we only need a constant value for a position and the rotation is the only thing that changes over time. So some bones require only rotation, others require both translation and rotation. So, how do we animate when we have a skeleton? Uh, a skeleton is in a pose at a certain moment in time. I am in a pose and how a pose looks like is determined by the transforms of all bones. I have a transform here, a transform here and a transform here. And animation is the process of changing the pose over time. We change how the different uh, translation and orientation of joints in the skeleton. Deformation is the process of taking a single pose and applying it to a mesh vertices because we might need to change the vert how a 3D model looks like depending on the animation state, the pose of an object. Animation does not know about vertices, it only uses the skeleton of a rig. And deformation doesn't know about the concept of time, it doesn't move over time, it simply transfer the current pose onto vertices. Animation is run on the CPU where we create a running animation or jumping animation, what we do. And deformation is running the rendering engine on the G GPU in the vertex shader. For so as we have mentioned before, we make a distinction between instance data, health points, position and shared data, which uh, can be textures and meshes. And the same applies to animations. It's a waste of memory to store the actual animation in each instance if we have 200 orcs. So we share it between multiple instances of the same type. There are, there are however, some unique data about the animation that each instance needs to store. The animation state how far we are in the animation sequence, the current position of the bones, and the speed the animation is playing at. So we need to store something. An, anima an animation has both a shared and a unique data parts. So how much memory is required for an an animations? If a game runs at 30 frames per second, we have five major characters with 100 animations each and 50 minor characters with 20 animations each. And each animation lasts on average 4 seconds. All characters have 50 bones each. A 3 times 3 matrix translation orations 
or in rotation scale is used for each bone, MUN matrix stored for each frame of the animation. The total memory requirement is then, if we calculate it and using float values, then it will be approximately 164 megabytes for all the animations in this game. And it's quite a lot of memory. And sometimes we simply don't have that much memory available, so we need to compress it somehow. So, how can we reduce it? Well, as mentioned before, not all bones require translation. Scale is rarely used. The largest gain is, however, not to store the animation at each frame if we have 30 frames per second, because very little happen between two frames if a frame is 1 30th of a second. It's very, very, very small movement. Instead, we store an animation by certain keyframes, so we can store every 10th frame or something, and we interpolate the values between two keyframes. So, example of an animation, the brown frames are keyframe, and is stored for the animation, and the blue is the interpolation between two keyframes. We calculate how the skeleton and joints will be positioned between two keyframes. And an example of keyframes for a jump animation, start by standing up, going down, we jump and then land and go to a crawl position. And we can interpolate between these five states to produce a smooth jumping animation. So by using keyframes we can greatly reduce the memory needed for animations. Uh, we might only need to store every 10 frame or maybe even less than that. Another important benefit is that the graphical artists don't have to draw all frames for an animation, they only draw the keyframes and the graphics, the animation engine takes care of how the animation will look like between the keyframes. So we only need to draw how the model looks like at the specific keyframes. And it greatly reduces the development time and costs for a game, because we don't have to write that many uh, models in the animations. And how many keyframes that is needed for an animation depends on the motion in the animation, and there are no general guidelines for selecting this. So, for example, a fast-turning rotor on a plane needs many keyframes, maybe up to 10 per second, because it moves very fast, it rotates. But if a person is asleep, the animation almost entirely consists of a rise and fall of a chest when we breathe. And in that case, we can interpolate between a rise and a fallen chest, requiring maybe only two keyframes for around five seconds. So it totally depends on the speed and complexity of the animation. Interpolation between translation scale and shear is, is quite simple. We only need to linearly interpolate between two values. So if we have position T1, 10, 50, 30, position T2, 6, 56, 30, then between those two we have position 8, 53, 30. So we can just linearly interpolate between two positions. There is a problem, however, for rotations. Interpolation for rotations is not as simple as we think it should be. So we need to delve a bit more into rotations. So rotation means how the bone is rotated in the joint relative to its parent bone. And this may sound simple. We just rotate the bone around the x, y and z axis. However, it turns out that math has some nasty surprises for us. The first rotation model is Euler angles, and it means that we rotate some angle around the different axes. So, it's a set of three angles that describe any orientation of an object in 3D space, and each of the three angles represent a rotation around one of x, y, and z axes. So, rotation around y, x, z, for example. And the order of rotations is important. Rotation on 90 degrees around the x followed by 90 degrees around y is not the same as 90 degrees around y followed by 90 degrees around x. So it's not a commutative operation. And there are several different orderings used in different 3D engines. 
And in this lecture, we will use the most common ordering, meaning that we first rotate around the xy axis, then y, and then z axis. Uh, it turns out that Euler angles has a problem, and it's a very serious problem, and it's often referred to as the gimbal lock. Consider two rotations in the xyz angle convention, 90, 90, minus 90, and 0, 90, 0. Let's see how they look like in 3D space, so we take out our spaceship. So the first rotation, 90, 90, minus 90. First we rotate 90 degrees around x, then 90 degrees around y, and we have this result, and then we rotate nine, minus 90 around z-axis, and we have different v-axis here. And this is the final result. And the rotation 0, 90, 0, this is the initial position, this is the final position, and if we put them both together, we will see that they produce the same result. So, Euler angles have what is called poles at some places, meaning that different rotations produce the same result. And this is not much of a problem if we have static orientations. The problem comes when we store animations using Euler angles. So, to save space, we store character animations in discrete time steps, keyframes, and interpolate between the orientations of two steps. And to store every possible orientation between two poses would take up too much memory. So, we only store the rotations at the keyframes and interpolate between the rotations. And when interpolating between two orientations, the problems with poles become apparent. Consider the two orientations 0, 88, 0, and 2, 90, 0. They are fairly close, so a numerical 1, 89, 0 is a fairly good halfway point. But if we do the same on our previous orientations, 90, 90, minus 90, and 0, 90, 0, we will get halfway point that is 45, 90, minus 45. We do, however, know that they both produce the same result, so 45, 90, minus 45, is in fact a very terrible halfway point. So linear interpolation between two orientations can produce very, very weird results due to the poles, and which is called the gimbal lock problem. So, in fact, there is no efficient interpolation method that always produces good results when we use Euler angles. There are methods that produce good results, but they are computationally very expensive, so it's not a good option for us to use them. There are two other alternative methods that are better than using Euler angles. It's the 3 times 3 rotation matrix, or use something called quaternions. The 3 times 3 rotation matrix, matrix is a matrix representing the x, y, and z axis of a new local space. So we define a new local space, we rotate the whole local space. So we rotate around the axis in the local space. Uh, we in all angles we have an angle rotating around the axis. Now we define new positions of the axis. So we don't only define an angle where we move the axis, we define new axis and it's much simpler to calculate or interpolate between two vectors than interpolate a rotation. If we also need a translation, a 4x4 matrix is required. So the first is the x-axis, then we have a y-axis and the z-axis, and the fourth is a translation. So we have a local space axis at time step t0, and we can rotate the local space axis at time step t1. So the rotation is not in angles, but in new axis vector, and the values between two matrices are usually quite similar, because we don't move that far. So a simple linear interpolation where we calculate the average values work much better uh, than interpolation, linear interpolation for all the angles. So we have solved some problems. There are, however, two major problems with 3 times 3 rotation matrices, because the first one, we need 9 values instead of 3, which we use for Euler angles. Uh, so we need to store much more. Uh, and more memory is needed if we have many animations. The interpolation is not a pure rotation. If we rotate between two uh, 
uh, and will linearly interpolate between these two positions, the arm will be slightly scaled in the center because this is not a linear movement, it's a uh, follow some curve. So some scale can creep in, which is a larger problem. Uh, we can solve this by having orthonormal matrices, which an, is an orthogonal and normalized matrix, matrix but they require, it some, requires some expensive calculation, so it's not a good way, good way to go. So to avoid these problems, we need to use something called quaternions, which are standard in most game systems today. Quaternions does not suffer from the polar problem of Euler angles and they require less memory than 3 times 3 rotation matrices and no scale creep in. A quaternion is a vector composed of the four components x, y, z and w. x, y and z defines an arbitrary axis of rotation, the axis we rotate around and it does not have to be aligned with a regular x, y or z axis. And the x, y and z values are chosen so that the length of a vector defines the sine value of half the rotation angle. And the w value defines the cosine value of half the rotation angle. With the four w component added, we can tell the difference between a rotation of 20 degrees and a rotation of 340 degrees, which ends up at the same place, place, or minus 20 and 340. Both rotations have the same half angle sine values, but different half angle cosine values. So interpolating between two quaternions is fast and gives reasonably good results. So, and they are mathematically quite complex, but it's the best option we have. Uh, we will not go into more details about them in this course because there are some quite difficult math behind them, but we should know that what they are and that we can use them without completely understanding the math behind them. So by defining two rotations, orientation in, for example, oil or angel, angels, the engine can, and unit engine can, for example, translate them into quaternions to be used internally when interpolating in animations and other rotations. So quaternions is the best way to go, but we can define the rotation in Euler angles and then convert it into quaternions internally. Uh, there is a good article available at this link if you're interested in understanding quaternions. The, but it is important to know that they don't suffer from the gimbal lock problem. They require less memory, run 3 times 3 rotation matrices, and they are easy to interpolate between. And there are some different ways of interpolating between quaternions. The first one is the end lerp or the normalizing lerp. The four components of the two quaternions are linearly interpolated when normalized. The spherical lerp has a rotation along an arc instead of a straight line. The log quaternion lerp or exponential map interpolation is a mathematically quite complex method that involves lots of calculations. So, each of these interpolation methods have some properties. And one desired property is for the interpolation to be along the shortest path, 20 versus 340 degrees. Should we move 20 or move a whole circle around? And log quaternion does not satisfy this, the other two do. A second desirable property is that in the interpolation occurs at a constant speed. The animation does not speed up or slow down along the way. And end lerp does not satisfy this, but the other two do. And the third property is whether three or more quaternions can be interpolated together with a result independent of the order of interpolation. And s lerp does not satisfy this, but the other two do. So they all satisfy two out of three desirable properties. So which one should we choose? No blending method satisfy all three properties, only two of them. So we need to compromise in some way when selecting a method. So what is important when we choose one of these method, methods? The first thing is that in animation we usually interpolate between quaternions that are quite close together. 
So if they are not more than around one de degree apart, all three methods produce almost identical results. But what if we do larger interpolations? Log quaternion turns out to produce the worst result since it's not guaranteed to follow the shortest path. So the choice is then between nlerp and slurp. nlerp has some advantages, it's faster and the order of blending does not matter. The only disadvantage of nlerp is the non-constant speed. However, it turns out that for interpolations of 45 degrees, quite large rotations, the steep B difference is only around 5%, which is in practice hardly noticeable. Low quaternion is computationally very expensive. It does not produce better results than the others, so we can skip that one. And in most cases, NLR produced just as good as slurp and is computationally cheaper. So, to summarize, NLRP is the most obvious choice for blending animations, but if you read up on it, many developers say that SLURP is the best. And a way of testing it is to implement both NLRP and SLURP version and let the testers decide which one they prefer. And if they think both look good, use NLRP because that's the least computationally expensive comp method. And Unity you internally uses quaternions for rotations and supports the different interpolation methods. And to help game developers, Unity have a lot of methods for translating other representation to quaternion, for example, Euler angles. So we rarely need to modify the actual X, Y, Z and W components of a quaternion. We can also have some complex motions. Uh, so how we reconstruct the poses between keyframes called in-between poses greatly affect the quality of an animation. And in the most simple case we can do a linear interpolation, but many motions are not straight lines. Instead they follow some sort of curve, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> a non-linear higher order interpolation. So let's consider the animation of a bouncing ball. <coughs> so linear interpolation between keyframes. On the left we see that it will be not very natural movement. It will be straight lines and then suddenly turn and it will look very weird. But if we use a higher order interpolation between the keyframe where we define some curve, the animation looks more natural and it only requires three keyframes instead of six in the first version and produces better results. So linear interpolation is not always the way to go. Instead we can use a higher order interpolation and the problem is then to find a curve that well approximates the motion. A common simple and very flexible curve is what's called the cubic Betzier curve. And for a linear interpolation between the two keyframes F1 and F2, we just need a conceptual time that is 0 at F1 and 1 at F2. And then we can calculate the result using this formula of the cubic Bessier curve. 1 minus T times F1 plus T times F2. And for a curve we also need some way of defining the shape of a curve so we have some control over how it looks like and for a cubic Bezier curve we can define the shape with two tangents tangent point one at each end so tangent at point F1 and the tangent at point F2 and the two tangents, tangents are stored as two extra keyframes they aren't real keyframes, the animation never goes through them but they define how the animation looks like so the start, end and tangent points are often called control points. And to calculate the curve of the control points F1, T1, T2 and F2, we use the following equation. This is the Bezier curve equation when we use the tangent points. And there is a quite funny website where you can play around with different cubic Bezier curves at this link. And the two tangents gives good control over the shape of a curve and can produce good looking approximations for example the bouncing ball animation and many more movements, for example smooth camera movements and similar for 
But for a cubic Bezier curve, we also need to store the two tangent points, so it requires substantially more memory than linear interpolation. But we can optimize some memory optimization. So the standard representation, four control points per curve segment is needed. So here we have two curve segments, the green and the purple one. And the first optimization is that the control point F, the end of the first segment and the start of the second segment is shared. So we only need to store one control point instead of two. The second op optimization, the T2, the tangent of the first segment points in the other direction, the opposite direction as we see here. So the T2 of the first segment can be shared with the T1 of the second segment. We just uh, reverse the direction of the tangent and then we can produce one virtual keyframe. Uh, the only problem is, is we have some discontinuity. So consider an animation of a bouncing ball at the second keyframe F2 here. The velocity of the curve changes abruptly, which is called the C1 discontinuity. And in this case, the T2 of segment 1 is not guaranteed to match the T1 of segment 2, uh, the tangent point. Uh, here they match, but depending on the angle where the ball hits the ground, they might not match and they cannot be shared. And we also have a C0 discontinuity. This happens if a value suddenly change. If an object is, for example, teleported to a new location, which it does here. So in this case, F2 of segment 1 cannot be shared with F1 of segment 2. And the same goes for the T1 and T2 points, tangent points. So to avoid problems with C0 and C1 discontinuities, each segment can have a list of indices to the control points it's using. If we don't have any discontinuities, the indices for F2 in segment 1 and F1 in segment 2 refers to the same control point. So we just keep an index to a control point and T2 of segment 1 and T1 of segment 2 also refer to the same control point. And if we have a discontinuity, the indices can point to unique control points. So here we have no continuities and the segment indices F1 goes to F1, F2 goes to F2, 1, so they share a lot. F2, the first two are shared with the last of the second segment is shared with the last two in the first segment. And if we have a discontinuity, all of them are unique for both segments, where they don't share anything between them. But even with optimizations, cubic Bezier curves has higher memory requirements than linear interpolation because we need to store some control points. But what we also must take into account is the quality of an animation because a high order interpolation can produce good quality animations with less keyframes than linear interpolation. So a very general figure is that the cubic Bezier curve interpolation can use roughly one tenth the number of keyframes as linear interpolation if we have movement along a curve and look just as good. And suddenly the extra memory needed for each keyframe is well worth it. Many animations loop. When the animation is finished, it's restarted and played again if we have running, jumping, perhaps walking. And if we are looping animations, it's important that the end and start is C0 and C1 continuous. If not, the transition from end to start can look very weird and the player will notice bugs in the rendering, the animation. So it's up to the animators to make sure that animations are continuous unless they never loop. A special case of looping is if we play one animation directly after another, for example going from walking to running. In this case we might need to create a special transition animation to make the transition from walking to running look good. So that's also something the graphical artist might need to do to make your game look, look good. So when we play animation, we need to have a concept of time. And there are two times that are important. The local time, 
It starts at zero when the animation begins and ends at the original length of the animation. So a five second animation has a local time going from zero to five. And the global time is the time that actually passes in the game. And when we sample an animation, when we uh, take the poses from the animation, we need to find the local time for the current game frame, which is in global time. So we need to calculate, make it trans transform the local time to the global time and vice versa and interpolate between the keyframes unless we are exactly at the keyframe and an animation can also be played at different speeds so local time passes faster or slower than global time so playing an animation at normal speed starts at zero and goes to six and it's the same time that passes in the global time but we can also play it at half speed and then double the time, global time have passed for the same local time. So it's played much slower. And most animations only play at normal speed, but there are some cases where we need animations that play at different speeds in a game. Maybe your character can eat the speed, eat the speed boost pills and run twice as fast. And the ability to sample an animation at any time is called scrubbing and the animators need to design the animation so they look good at the speeds they need to be played at. And the developers must make sure that the game engine code supports scrubbing or at least that it can easily be added if needed. It can also happen that we need to blend several animations together. So the basic task of an animation system is to play back a single animation which involves, as we have discussed, interpolation between two orientations. And most animation systems also support blending. Multiple animations are played and blended together. And blending also involves interpolation, and we have similar problem as when interpolation, interpolating between keyframes, because we have two rotations in the animations that we blend together. And it's also very common that we might wait for components of one animation is more prominent than the other. So the standard two-way blending uses the same fraction of both animations and it's possible to change the influence one an animation has on the result by adding a weight. So for example two times animation one plus one animation B and the result is the result divided by the total weight and then animation A will then have two-third influence and animation B one-third influence. And it's quite common that we only want to animate a few bones rather than the whole skeleton. For example, if we turn the head or move the arm or something. For example, is if a character is waving. And to specify that an animation only affects some bones, we can use a bone mask. And it typically, typically consists of a list of values, one for each of our bone, between zero and one. And the value of zero means no influence, but my left arm is not involved when I wave with the right arm and the value of 1 means full influence for right arm joints and a value between 0 and 1 means a fractional blend and bone masks is useful if we have multiple animations that each only affect some part of the skeleton we can have one animation for the face, one for the upper part of the body when we wave one for the lower part of the body when we move and the blending weight is determined at bone level instead of one weight for the whole animation. So to produce good results we can use a fractional blend where animations meet, for example the shoulder bone in the waving animation affects the shoulder in some way but not very much. And sometimes we have more than one animation for the upper part of the body and more than one for the lower part. And a good approach is then to first blend all animations for the upper body part and blend all animations for the lower body part and blend the results from the previous steps to a final result which is what we call hierarchical blending. So we can blend the results from a wave and a face smile animation and we can blend the results for a jump and run animation and then we can blend the two results to a final blend result when we have hierarchical blending. The final thing we need to know about is what is called motion extraction. And running an animation on a stationary character is easy. If I wave, nothing happens. The character is at the same 
position after the animation that it was before the animation was played. I don't move when I wave. But what about, for example, a running animation? It not only affects the bones of the skeleton, but also the position of a character. So the character moves when it runs. And if a running animation is not synced with the movement of a character, it will look like the character is sliding on the ground. It will do some moonwalk movement like. So to make a running look good, we must know the distance a running animation moves the character. And this is called motion extraction. We extract some motion from an animation to know how far the animation moves the character. And the most simple version is linear motion extraction. So linear interpolation is very usual, useful. And it works like this. Take the position of a rope root bone at the last frame of animation. This is where I ended up when I moved. Subtract by the position of a root bone at the first frame of an anim animation where I started. And now we know how the character moved during the animation. And if we, for example, are halfway through the animation, we can linearly interpolate between the start and end positions to know where I am halfway through the animation. And the character moves during the animation. So it looks like this, the local position we start running, halfway we are at 5 and at the end of the animation we have moved 10 steps in the x direction and the global position is changed accordingly so the character actually runs even in the global game world. And the jump we also change the height, the y position of, yeah, so the character jumps and goes down. The only drawback with this approach is that it does not capture rotational movement. If a character is turning on the spot, so I walk down, I turn around, I walk back, linear motion extraction thinks nothing has happened because I ended up at the same position as I started. And to solve this, we simply take the rotation of the last frame minus the rotation of the first frame, and we have a rotational velocity. And we can then use interpolation with quaternions. A problem is still if we have a character going around a corner on a house, since linear motion expression will interpolate between last and first frame, the result will look like this. So the character move goes around the house a corner, but when we linearly interpolate, it we will interpolate a straight line between the start and end position, which goes through the house. So the character will collide with the house, which is not correct. So to solve this, we can use something called composite motion extraction. So instead of interpolating between the last and first frame, we interpolate between each keyframe in the animation. And the same example would then look like this, where we have a keyframe where we turn around the corner and we interpolate between the different keyframes, and it will look good. Uh, and they work fine, both LME and C CME, unless we have nonlinear interpolation between keyframes, like in the previous bouncing ball example. And to solve this, we need to sample the animation each frame. So we can use, for example, the Bezier curve, and we sample each step in the animation, each frame, and calculate the translation of change, change in position and rotation of a root bound between the current and previous frame, which is called variable delta extraction and the delta is then used to move the instance, and the instance then always follows the root bone. Uh, so if we have nonlinear movement, we need to do something like this. So a motion extraction along a curve with CME, then we will still interpolate linearly between the keyframes, and it would look bad, but motion extraction with variable delta extraction will sample and follow the curve so it will look much better. And some final things about the root bone. The root bone should be the one in the skeleton that rotates as little as possible, because if a root bone rotates a lot, the instance, would instance the whole object, game world object, would constantly change direction when using motion extraction. So for a human character, it's usually the pelvis is chosen as the root bone as in the figure here. 
We can also use something called synthetic rope, root bone. It's not a real root bone in the skeleton. And it completely avoids unplanned direction changes of an instance since it's an abstract bone or as called a synthetic root bone. A synthetic root bone always follows the direction of the instance of a game world object and is usually placed on the ground at the center of gravity uh, and what we call the ground shadow between the feet of a humanoid character. And when animating stuff, the final thing we need to do is to deform the meshes. So we have looped, sampled, interpolated and blended animations and the next step is to render the animated entities on the screen. The problem is that we only know how it looks like in its local space. So each mesh of an entity must be deformed before being rendered on the screen because the triangles will change when we animate an object. And this process is called mesh deformation and it's a very complex operation and the most graphic libraries solve it for us so we won't go into it in detail here. So to summarize this lecture, character animation is a complex task involving lots of subtasks and problems that needs to be solved. One such task is interpolation between transform, for example when interpolation between different keyframes to save memory or blending several animations. Interpolations of position and scale can be done with simple linear transformation. Interpolation of rotations is a bit more tricky and is best done with quaternions to avoid the gimbal lock problem. Quaternions can be interpolated using several methods of which lerp or possibly slerp is the most suitable. For smooth complex motions between keyframes, Bezier curves or other curves can be used. When running in many animations, the instant changes position in the game world. To calculate position of an instance during an animation, we need to extract the motion from the animation. And the most common motion extraction techniques are linear motion extraction, where we interpolate between last and first frame of the animation, or composite motion extraction, where we interpolate between each keyframe of the animation. So that's all for today and all for this course. Uh, you also have two practical lectures where I show how to use the Unity to make the rollerball project and the Space Shooter project. So make sure that you check those out. So that's all for today. Uh, thanks for listening. My name is Johan Hagelbeck and this course is 1DV437 Introduction to Game Programming. Thanks. <laughs>